So church, we are continuing our series of Do You Know That You Are My Child? We've designed this series to remind all of us of what God will do to save us, what his salvation gives us, and that we receive a new identity when we believe in Jesus Christ. And over these several weeks, we've been unpacking different aspects of that. And so this morning, I want to begin with a story. Uh, I don't think I've shared this before, uh, but at one point in my life, uh, I was part of the Porter County Veterans Court. If you don't know what that is, so years ago, uh, Judge Gent, who is a military veteran, she served on the Porter County court system, she was seeing an influx of veterans into the court system. And uh, essentially what was happening is we had a large number of veterans coming back from the war in the Middle East, and uh, admittedly the, the VA system is broken, and they weren't getting the treatment that they needed, and so they, be, they started to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. And just over time, these veterans would usually end up in the court system. And so um, Judge Gent developed this court, and here's what happened. So if you were dealing with a low-level crime, this wasn't for high crime, this was for things like DUI and minor drug possessions and things like that, that it was an 18-month journey. And if you were in that court, if you were a veteran in that court, you were assigned a mentor. I served as a mentor. That was somebody that uh, led a successful life and could model that for the veteran who was going through the court. And then if they had an addiction problem, they were assigned a sponsor. And then they would go through different classes. And so they were, they were given tools to teach them how to view life and how to think about life differently. Uh, and then, as, in addition to all of that, uh, the court usually had some individual things that they would assign to uh, the individual uh, that was very specific to them. And so, at the end of that, an 18-month journey, if they went through all of that, upon graduation, their record was expunged. That they got a new start on life, that... Um, they could start all over again, but they were given tools that equipped them to do that. And so, if you don't know what expunge means, I'll just give you a legal term here. It means to destroy, obliterate, or strike out records or information in files, computers, or other depositories. Meaning, when those veterans successfully completed that journey, it's as if the crime never happened. It's as what they did is gone forever, and they get to start over. What's amazing in Christianity is we have a term for that. We call it justification. I want to begin with a definition. Now, I'm going to make a couple of disclaimers this morning. One, this is like a, a concept that is hard to understand, and sometimes it can be difficult to accept. And so uh, give yourself some grace as we talk about justification this morning. Um, and also, it is, it's very, very complex, and it's more than what I could ever cover in a su Sunday morning. So I'm going to try and just land in the middle the best that I can with this topic. And so as we talk about justification, I'll give you a definition to start us off. It is a forensic term opposed to condemnation. As regards its nature, it is the judicial act of God by which he pardons all the sins of those who believe in Christ and accounts, accepts, and treats them as righteous. It is a judicial act. We often don't think in these terms uh, when we talk about God, but we say it all the time we, in, in songs and we talk about uh, we have a righteous judge and we use these terms, but we don't actually think how that's actually lived out. 
Well, it's lived down in justification that he is our judge. But maybe some of you are saying, well, why do we need justification? What, where do we start with that? Well, Paul gives us the most comprehensive understanding of justification in the Bible, and uh, he does that in Romans. And so we're going to stay in the book of Romans this morning, if you want to join us. We're going to begin in Romans 3. And here's what Paul says about us, why we need justification. Beginning in verse 10, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. Their po- the poison of asps is under their lisp, lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul's talking about us. Pre-salvation. Now, maybe this will get you a little bit uncomfortable, but we have to have a reality check. Who we are before our salvation is this definition that we are determined to destroy this world, only seek the things that we want to seek, and we have very little peace in this life. All of those things, and on and on and on. The Bible, many times, uses two different terms to define us in pre-salvation. One is children of wrath, and the other one is sons and daughters of disobedience. It's important that we start from this place because if we start from the place of, oh, well, I'm, I'm a good person. Not by nature, you're not. No. Pre-salvation, you're not. And we have to start from that place so we can understand what justification means. To help us, I want to read, actually, the Church of the Nazarene statement on justification Our wording is very, very pointed and very concise. Our statement says, We believe that justification is the gracious and judicial act of God by which he grants full pardon of all guilt and complete release from the penalty of sins committed and acceptance as righteous to all who believe on Jesus Christ and receive him as Lord and Savior. I don't know if you've ever read that statement before, read our own statement on justification. But did you hear in the language that we acknowledge, one, it is a gracious act, but it's a judicial act, removing the penalty of sin, granting us full pardon, and it's important that you hear that full, full pardon of our sins. And so this is coming to understand justification, something very gracious that God does in our salvation. So how are we to understand justification? Let's begin by saying that it is a gift from God. Romans 3, 23 begins with, For all have sinned. That, we just said, said that. Paul says that just a few verses earlier. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. It's a gift. We have no way of becoming righteous. We have no way intrinsically in ourselves of justifying ourselves. So it has to come from something. Paul says it comes from Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was obedient to God and died on the cross for our sins, it is his righteousness that is imputed on us. Now bear with me this morning. I'm going to use a few theological terms, and I try not to do that, but it's important that you know some of these. Imputed 
means a value assigned to something by inference from the value of something else. In other words, since our salvation cannot be er earned, we cannot do enough good acts to remove the stain of sin. So, our value has to come from something else. Our value, our righteousness, comes from Jesus Christ because he is righteous and we are now declared righteous in our salvation. We have to start from that point. And mentioning that we are declared righteous, that is the next thing, that it is a declaration. What I mean by that is justification means to declare righteous. Specifically, to, to declare righteous, let me try that again, to declare righteous upon the act of faith based upon the work of another, the divine substitute, Jesus Christ. What it does not mean is that we are instantaneously changed into a righteous person upon our salvation. This is important to make this distinction. So when we're talking about justification, it's that God is declaring us righteous. It's not that when we are saved, none of us should go, oh, well, I'm good, I'm holy. I don't have to worry about anything. We're not saying that. We're saying that God is declaring us righteous. In other words, justification means that a person's status, it's looking at a person's status before God apart from their moral status. So that's what imputed means. So this is a little tough to understand. Justification is the legal act wherein God pronounces that the believing sinner has been credited with all the virtues of Jesus Christ. When we are saved by Jesus Christ, in God's forgiveness, our sins are taken away, and with justification, divine righteousness is given to us. Maybe you've never heard that before. There's a lot that happens in the moment we are saved. It's not just that we're saved and, and Christ forgives us. There's actually other things that are happening, and we're zeroing in on that this morning. And I want you to understand this, and, and I'm kind of pausing from the sermon for a moment, because you need to, to hear these things. Because they impact how we view our relationship with God. So when we talk about, do you know that you're my child? Do you understand what you're receiving in your salvation? And do you understand who it comes from? So justification is also has a present aspect to it. Here's what I mean by that. Romans 3.24, picking up from that verse, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What Paul is saying there is that today you are declared righteous. We have a saying in the church, when you, go, when you enter into the gates of heaven, that all of us want to hear, what do we want to hear? Well done, good and faithful servant, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's referring to our righteousness. But do you know that you have that today? See, I don't think some of us grasp that. Then in the moment of your salvation, God is saying, you are justified. I am declaring you righteous. If you're my child, you shouldn't look like me, so you are righteous that's today and because of that we are now identified as his children jumping to Romans 10 
beginning verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. What Paul is saying is everyone is able to be called a child of God. Everyone. We like to put up barriers in our humanity. And what Paul is saying, when he uses the terms Jew and Greek, he's referring to the known world at that point. And he's saying it doesn't make a difference, your nationality, your race, your sex, all of that. doesn't make a difference. All can be called a child of God. But more specific, some of you need to hear this. No matter what you have done, no matter how many times you've sinned, no matter how many times you've repented, it doesn't matter how other people view your worth. It doesn't even matter how you view your own worth. What's happening here is that God is saying you are righteous. You have immeasurable value in my kingdom because you are my child. I think that's the part that sometimes some of us have a hard time accepting. Maybe we've never really been loved. Maybe we've never really been accepted by society, by our culture, maybe even our own family. This is why when you receive love from the Father, it's unlike any other love you've ever had. Because it's perfect. What is interesting about this, about justification. I, I read a term this week and it just it stuck with me all week that heaven is inclusion by grace. I love that term. It's inclusion by grace. You can't buy your way in. You can't do enough good works. And it's not exclusive. Right? It's not that, oh, well, if your name's not on this list, it's not like Santa Claus. But rather, if you declare your faith in Jesus Christ, it's inclusion by grace. It's a gift that's been given to you. So we're to understand justification as a free gift from God. Whereas he declares us his children today. We also understand that justification comes to us under one condition. Some of you are going to go, up. Oh, see, there it is, Pastor. I've been waiting. There's always a catch. Here's the condition that we have faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's your big conditional statement. You have to have faith in Jesus. Paul tells us this in Romans 10. He said, if you confess, there's the conditional, if, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and, oh, see, now there's more to it. There's, oh, see, there's more. You've got to read the fine print. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. What Paul is saying is, and I appreciate that he says this, it's not enough to say, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. Has anybody ever seen any hypocrisy in the church? Please don't raise your hand. Right? We, we say, well, no, I'm a Christian, and we'll affirm all these things, and we'll worship, and we'll amen, pastor, and blah, blah, blah. And we walk out the door, and it's like a holy terror is running through right behind you, a path of destruction, because we don't actually live out this faith. We don't believe it. We don't understand what we've been given. You see, when we start to understand terms like justification, 
we're starting to understand that God has so much more for us. It's not just our salvation. It's not just, hey, at the end of this, I get to go to heaven. No. It's not enough to just say, I believe, I I confess my sins. You have to believe it in your heart. And if you believe it in your heart, transformational things happen. That's Paul's point. So let's look at what those transformational things are in relationship to justification. In other words, what does justification bring to us? It brings us into a right relationship with God. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. We talked about this a little bit in my life group this morning. We have terms pre-salvation, right? I already talked about them. Children of wrath, sons of disobedience. Wonderful titles to have, isn't it? But what do those indicate? That we're at war. Well, who are we at war with? With God, right? Right? We're labeled children of wrath because we were created in his image and yet we rebel against him. So those titles are pointing that we have this war that is raging between us as individuals and corporately with God. But justification brings us peace. We are now restored and we have a right relationship with God. We now have the relationship that we were intended to have with the Father. A peaceful, loving relationship between Father, the Father, and child. See, justification is doing a lot more than you thought it did. It's creating restoration. It gives us an assurance of forgiveness Just a little bit further down in Romans 5 and verse 9. Much more than having now been justified. See that term Paul is using over and over again. Having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Again, there's a lot of uncomfortableness in this sermon. We don't like to talk about God's wrath and judgment It would make us feel uncomfortable. Rather, as a Christian, you should hold fast to this and understand the difference. We don't lord it over people, but rather, we come to understand that as children of wrath, we are deserving of God's judgment and punishment. For we were created in his image to go and do good works, to lead others to Christ, to have an impact in the world around us. Each and every day. And so when we're justified, all of those sins are removed. We're no longer under the threat of penalty of sin. All of our sins have been covered by the blood of Christ. And we are now free to live a new life. But I've been a pastor long enough to know this. There's more than one here. You're saying, yeah, but pastor, you don't know all that I've done. You don't know the deep, dark corners of my life. No, but God does. You think you're actually hiding something from God? When you are saved, all of that, let let me go back to our statement As a denomination, our statement on justification, it's a full pardon. Didn't say partial. Didn't say, well, God will pardon you up to eh, that point. Put the brakes on. Can't do that. Can't pardon you on that one. No, no, no. It's a full pardon. You're free of that. When you come to understand that God has forgiven you, listen to this, what you have done, maybe what you are doing, and maybe what you will do. 
When you live a repentant life, God forgives. Period. So there is an assurance of forgiveness in our justification. Very closely related to that is a freedom from condemnation. Paul writes in Romans 8, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jumping all the way down to verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. This is really important for some of us. What Paul is teaching us is no one can hold our past sins over us. For our sins have been forgiven. This happens, quite honestly, to to a lot of us on our salvation. Especially if you're like me, you come to know the Lord later in life. I have an affectionate term. I have a life BC before Christ. I have a train wreck of all sorts of bad gook in my past. Upon receiving salvation, had people say, do you really think Jesus is going to forgive you of that? I was with you when you did that. Come on, really? Yet Paul says there's no condemnation. None. But more than that, We ourselves cannot hold on to the guilt and shame and condemn ourselves for the things we have done in the past. Some of us do that. It it breaks my heart when I come across Christians who have been in the church for decades and they say, no, I believe in Jesus, but I, I know he just can't forgive me of this one thing. And they hold on to that. And I just, I just want to grab them, one, and hug them. But also, two, do you not understand your faith? When we're justified, God erases all of that. There is no condemnation. None. None by others, and more specifically, none by God. Jesus Christ died on the cross so we could live a new life. He didn't die on the cross so we could mope around, so we could still be under the chains of bondage of an old sin. He didn't die for that. He died so we could live a life like we have never lived before. A life full of love, of peace, of joy. One that is able to persevere and endure the trials of this world with strength and assurance because we are children of God. And lastly, justification brings us freedom from dominion by sin. Romans 6, beginning in verse 14, says, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall it be, sorry, what then shall we say, sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that through you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Justification is saying you have been declared righteous. We are no longer slaves to sin. 
our justification comes from the creator of the universe. Let me use another term there. It's not just God. He's the creator of everything, of all life. He gives us power through the Holy Spirit to permanently defeat sin. Some of us struggle with that. Post-salvation, like, I cannot get rid of this sin. I struggle with that. You've been given a new life. And this justification gives you freedom from that sin. Now, that's a topic all on its own. I'll admit that. If you want to start to understand this, go read the book of Romans for the next year. And you'll start to understand what all this means. So, I want to talk in my remaining time this morning about how to apply this. Because one of the things I love to do is as I'm teaching you about Scripture and about the, God's Word, is oftentimes, well, well, how to apply this. But here's the thing. With justification, you're not the one doing that. That's God. There's nothing you can do to justify yourself. So the question really becomes, what can we do in response to God's gracious pardon? And the answer is simple. We simply live a holy life because God has declared us righteous. I want to read Romans 6 beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus have been baptized to his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. We just had baptisms just a couple weeks ago, and I referenced this. That for those that were baptized, we were laying down into a watery grave. It is a reflection of the death of Christ, that you're putting your old way of life to death, and when we bring you up out of the water, it is very much a new life. This is how you are to live. You have been declared new. You've been given a whole new life. You've been justified. Continuing on, verse 5, For if we become united with him... In the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is a master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there's Paul's point, so Paul's wordy. Admittedly, so he takes 12 verses to say this. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. That's a pretty big statement Paul's making. How should you view yourself? Somebody that's been raised from the dead. You've been given a whole new life. And part of that life is justification. You are righteous. You are a child of God. 
Justification should lead us to living a holy life, a righteous life. Having that emotion, having that moment of reckoning where we realize that we were raised from the dead and we've been given a whole new chance on life. We've been given this new life. That should transform our hearts. And we should want to now live out a holy and righteous life. The transition from being declared righteous by God to living a righteous life is called sanctification. Where justification declares us righteous, sanctification means we are living a righteous life. So I kind of hinted at that earlier. I said that justification is a declaration. God is saying, you are holy, you are righteous, you are one of mine. He says that apart from our moral standing, meaning we may still sin. We probably are going to go through a long process of transformation because we're humans and we're stubborn. At least if you're like me. It took me a while to figure it out. That process is called sanctification. The point is, is that through that process, we are continually moving closer to us. It does not negate the fact that he calls us righteous. God is just waiting for us to figure that out. That we ourselves understand that we are, and we need to live that life. John Wesley, whom we get our theology from, has a beautiful statement about justification. He writes this, I believe three things must go together in our justification. Upon God's part, his great mercy and grace. Upon Christ's part, the sanctification of God's justice by the offering of his body and shedding of his blood and fulfilling the law of God perfectly. And upon our part, true and living faith in the merits of Jesus Christ. John Wesley just said everything I said in that statement. But he ends it with our part. Our role in justification is to now actually live out that life. To be righteous. To be like his son. At the end of our message today, I hope that you would come to realize that justification is a Trinitarian event. Meaning all three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, are engaged with us. The Father is the beginning and the end of our justification. It is the Father who issues us a full pardon of our sins and welcomes us into eternity. The Son purchases our justification by his atoning blood, and he becomes our mediator, our high priest who stands between us and God, pleading our case when we repent of our sins. And the Holy Spirit applies the benefits of justification to us as God's children. It is the Holy Spirit, it is he who enables, inspires, assists, guides, comforts, assures, and sanctifies our new holy lives. Justification is a massive topic, one that doesn't get preached enough. How many times have you been told in your life you are holy, you are righteous? Not too many, right? The world will tell us what we're not. God tells us what we are. Let me say that again. God tells us what we are. We are his children, created in his image, We are meant, designed, created to live a holy life. I want to return to my beginning story of the Porter County Veterans Court. As I walked that journey for a number of years with several veterans, I came to witness 
this a few times. Despite every veteran being told that if they do the hard work of changing their lives around, that they complete the training, they meet weekly with both mentors and sponsors, they complete all of the tasks laid out for them by the court and attend court twice a month, and then at the end of all of that, they will have their record expunged. Despite becoming a better person, equipped with tools to help them navigate life, and having broken the addictions that led them to court, despite all of that, some of those veterans would either choose not to enter into the program or they would quit the program halfway through. It boggled my mind sitting there in court and watching somebody that was facing not 60 or 90 days in jail. One individual in particular was facing five years in jail. Five years of being removed from society and all you have to do is here's a program that's laid out by professionals of people who actually care for you, will invest in your life. All you have to do is listen to them, change, and you're actually beginning, you're going to have tools that are going to help you in this life, become better, change your way of thinking, and, oh, by the way, that charge is going to be thrown out. And you walk out of the courtroom at the end of that. Despite all that, people would say no. It's human nature. Here's what I know by human nature. Despite being told today that you have been declared righteous by God, because you confess the name of Jesus Christ, and all you have to do in return is live a holy life, despite that, Some of you will not put your old life to death. Some of you will not believe what Paul has taught us today. And some of you will simply never be willing to even try. You'll never have a relationship with Christ. You think this is all hokum. Despite knowing that God has pardoned all of your sins, all of them, that he calls you his child and offers you an eternity of peace under his grace. Some of you will still walk away from that. So I want to end in a very unusual place this morning. I'm going to take us back to Romans 1. And the reason I'm taking us to Romans 1 is Paul does something very interesting when he is introducing himself to the church. This was a letter that was read to the church, and this is how he started that letter. And as you walk out of the sanctuary when this service is over, I want you to take this with you, and I want you to ponder on this part of it. That's why I'm starting from this part. Paul begins, he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. So Paul, that's a condensed version of the gospel. He's saying, this is who Jesus is. And then he continues on, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Paul is writing this to the church. I'm not being cute when I do this. 
Paul's writing this to South Lake. And he's saying this. He's saying to you, South Lake, among whom you, you, South Lake, are the called of Jesus Christ, to whom are beloved of God in Rome, in Crown Point, called as saints. Grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I used to stumble on that. Why does, why does Paul all, always call the church saints? Because Paul understood justification. If what Paul is teaching, what I am teaching this morning is true, in the moment of salvation, you are not only saved, but you are declared righteous. In other words, you are saints. That's why he's making the statement. You're a saint. Now, now, go live like that. That is your mission. For the Father has declared you holy and righteous. Now, be that example to the world. So this morning, we're going to close in worship. We're going to listen to our wonderful worship team saying this is our God. And I want you to listen very closely because this is our God who justifies who we are, that we are his children. Study those words as you worship with us. Would you simply hold out your hands like this? Go forward this week recognizing that the creator of the universe, our God, has called you holy and righteous. Go demonstrate that to the world in everything you do and you will be blessed beyond your understanding. Hug somebody, tell them you love them. We'll see you next week. God bless you all.